All right. Good morning. Let's pray before we sing. God, we just come before you, Lord, laying aside all distraction, God. Um, I pray that we would not be too focused on the day ahead or, uh, Lord, what we have after church or this coming week, but that we would just take a moment to put our full attention on you, Lord. Lord, that like Mary did, that we would just choose the better part to sit at your feet, to hear from your word, Lord, and learn more of you. God, we just thank you for the privilege that we can enter into your presence, Lord, that that veil was torn so that we can draw near to you, Lord, and have that personal, intimate relationship with you, God. Lord, we just ask that you would meet us here, that you would just fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit this morning, Lord. In your name, amen. You are a deep, deep well. You satisfy me. You satisfy me. I am a barren land. Tired and
draw me near and I'm comforted I'm surrendering to your embrace seems you work best in desert places how can it be that the son of god was born to us as a brother royalty now robed in flesh the glory of the father what do Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy, I should come to him. Jesus said if 
If I am weak, I should come to Him. And no one else can be my strength. I should come to Him. For the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to him. No one else can be my shield, I should come to him. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and Jesus said, if I am lost, he will come to me. And he showed me on that cross, he will come to me. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong. God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed, give me vision to see things like you do, God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from, give me wisdom, you know just what to do. I will love you. I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my shield. And I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you. God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed, give me vision to see things like you do, God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from, give me wisdom, you know just what to do. I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my shield. I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you, God. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Forever, all my days. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah. 
forever all my days. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you that you are in control, that you are sovereign over all, Lord. Lord, that you have a good and perfect plan for each one of us, Lord. That as we trust in you and lean on your understanding instead of our own, Lord, that you lead us forward in things that are for our good. Lord, things that grow us up and mature us, Lord. Lord, that give us a ministry in our lives to share the love of Christ. Lord, by our words, by our actions, God, I pray that you would just pour out your spirit on our lives, Lord. Lord, that we could pour that love back out into others. God, we just thank you for all that you are to us, Lord. Our treasure, our great reward, God. Lord, as we open up your word, I pray that you would bless it, Lord. That it would accomplish your will. God, we just thank you for this time together as the body of Christ to lift up your name because you are worthy, Lord. We pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. You guys can take a moment to greet one another.
Okay. Well, good morning. What a beautiful day. It's deceptive. It's cold. That's okay. I'm going to get these keys in my pocket. Okay. Well, um, just to kick things off, had a few announcement-ish things. Um, I'm not sure. I, I I just noticed yesterday evening, but um, f- local headlines, I guess the Oceanside High School football team won Northern State or Northern Class C. I didn't realize they were Class C. When I was a kid, Mountain View was Class B. Maybe that's why we're so terrible. I have no idea. But um, Class C champion football teams, that's kind of cool. Um, something to just celebrate as a community. Um, so if you see any kids with football helmets on, that's probably what they're doing. Uh, I guess they had a parade last night too with the police and everything. So Pretty, pretty big deal. Um, maybe I think I m- might have heard the sirens. Uh, yeah, that's what it was. I, I, we hear it all the time. So I was like, oh, another fire. But wait, this was legit. All right. So you were there. Um, um, on another thing that's going to be happening, we did it last year. We uh, took some time around this time, Thanksgiving time, and we ended up uh, decorating the church, and we still have all that stuff. And I was told that my mom is going to be the the leader for that, so you can go to her and ask her, ask Deb, for any, if you want to help with that. I think, I'm not sure what the, the day we were going to plan. Sunday after Thanksgiving, so that's when we're going to do it. Um, we'll plan to do that, um, and we'll dig all that stuff out. And, and then for the rest of the, um, the men's fellowship is going to be this Saturday morning at 9, um, so if you want to come out to that, welcome to. It's going to be right here in the sanctuary. And then we have our Thanksgiving fellowship that we, Wednesday night, the 22nd. We're going to do a hangout, potluck, whatever style food you want, because the next day is traditional, right, or whatever you do. So you can do whatever you want. Taco bar, I don't, you know, whatever works. But um, we're going to meet together for Thanksgiving, a little church family Thanksgiving on the 22nd, and it'll be at our regular time, uh, 6 o'clock. So... We'll, we'll get right into it, though. So if you want to come early, that's totally welcome, too. Go ahead. We'll be here. Um, and then uh, along those lines, I did want to mention that um, the youth outreach ministry that we've been participating in has been going great, and uh, I posted some things about it. Um, they're actually taking a break because of um, just the, for, for the month of November, they're actually doing some stuff to the community center so they can't meet. So they're just going to postpone it through the end of November. So if you're planning on coming or thought about it, that's what's going on. So he told me, um, Doran told me that they were going to just hold off until after November. And then he'll let me know when things pick back up. But it's been really great to to be participating in that. So if you have questions or want to chat about that, let me know. And, And then just another reminder, Christmas Eve falls on a Sunday this year, which gives us an interesting decision to make. So we decide not to choose choosing both. So we're going to do Sunday morning service, BAU, business as usual, and then in the evening, uh, maybe uh, four or five, we'll have to decide the exact time. Um, We'll have our evening service, which is focused on Christmas specifically. So we're not going to deviate from our normal, regular scheduled programming. We're going to just add the Christmas Eve service like we normally would if it wasn't on a Sunday. So that was the solution. So if you can come to both, that'd be great. If you can come to one, just that's awesome. If you can't come to any, we'll have to talk after church. <laughs> um, no, but, uh, but it, the, so we have some options there. We'll be here for both. So. Um, and then on a more serious note, well, we were to, um, shown on Facebook this morning, friends of ours, uh, the Schwartzes. Um, uh, Mark is um, pastoring a church in Augusta for Calvary Chapel right now. His wife, Holly, um, there too. And uh, Holly posted this morning that their son, their oldest son, Josiah, was in a very serious car accident either last night, late, or this morning, early. I'm not quite sure. He had to get life flighted to Bangor, you know, like emergency surgery. So very, very serious um, issue. So we ask for a prayer for him and their family as they're going through a very traumatic and sudden shift in life, which can happen from time to time, unfortunately, um, in various ways. But this one, he's a very young. I think he's 19, maybe 20, not just very, very young. Um, so very serious car accident. I, I believe it was a car accident, but she just said a very serious accident. He was in emergency surgery, but stable. So, but never quite out of the woods with stuff like that. So we just want to pray for them. 
So as we open up, we will do so. Um, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather as your people in your name. We pray that you would just bless this time of study in your word, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, give us understanding in the things that you have for each one of us to glean from this, this passage that you've chosen today as we go verse by verse through this book of 1 Corinthians. And so we just uh, open ourselves up, Lord, to whatever you have to say. Lord, we also lift up to you our dear brother and sister and their son, um, Josiah. I pray you'd be with him as he's going through this. Give the doctors wisdom and insight. Uh, we pray that you would receive the glory for the outcome and that you would just continue to work in the situation and to give the family uh, peace and comfort as they're going through this sudden change. Um, just, just things come up and it's just very very difficult, but Lord, you are the comforter, and you are the healer, and we, we know that you are there for all of us, and we just pray that you just give them this comfort today, Lord. We continue to lift them up as we hear more and more. We just, we just pray that you would be with Josiah and heal his body, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's uh, open up together in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you need a Bible to follow along, we have some on the in the back and on the side here. Feel free to grab one. Um, we're going to be starting where we left off. We finished verse 16. We're going to pick up in verse 17 and just continue all the way through to the end of the chapter today. That's the, that's the plan. So, um, so we'll get right into it. So he's, he's been going through this letter. Um, some of the part of the letter that we've read so far has been proactive, where he's addressing things that he's heard, things that need to be addressed. I mean, he's very specific things. And then he got into, uh, in chapter 7 here, more of the things that were um, things that they wrote to him, asking him questions. So we have to remember that context as we go through some of the things that he's saying. He's actually responding to questions that they had for him. So um, not necessarily things that he's heard, like he said before. So we want to just remember that they wrote a letter. They were asking him some, some very um, specific ministry questions, and so that's the context in which we have today as we continue to pick up in verse 17. I'm going to read through verse 24 to get us started, and then we'll go over these verses, and then we'll continue. So verse 17 says, But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not become circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. So, again, seemingly pretty straightforward. I want to, you know, as we go through, just kind of pull in other aspects of things that Paul has spoken of in, on these subjects and just kind of uh, unpack it a little bit. So, first thing he says is, but, so it, there's the previous thing. So, when he says, but, and he goes on, he was talking before about a marriage relationship. And so we kind of have to remember there's like relational things. There's states in which you're, you're called into your, he was talking about if you're already married, don't see like these different things. So in that same vein of thinking, but as God has distributed. And the word for distributed could also be defined as assigned or shared or even distribute as properly needed. So God has an idea. God has the best ideas and God will you know, prescribe those things to each one as the Lord has called each one. Now, there is a, a catch to that, not a catch so much, but, you know, like a nuance where you, you are free to reject what God has for you if you want. But he's saying God has distributed. So there's actually good news in this. So there's opportunity for anyone who wants it. God has distributed. He has opportunity for all who are called, each one. And so Paul would have them to walk in that. Paul would want them to walk in where they were called what they were called to from the Lord, the whatever they were called into, and then they continued to walk. And we talked about that walk is a sustained 
um, forward pace. Something that you do when you walk somewhere, you can probably walk a lot farther than you can run because eventually you're going to burn out and you're not going to be able to run. And if you just sit down and do nothing, you're not going anywhere. So the walk is a great example of what, I mean, think about, I mean, you know, not all, all of us are Forrest Gump. We can't run cross country, but some of us can walk a long way. With, you know, and something that God made our body is designed to be able to maintain that particular pace for a long length of time. And it's supposed to kind of give us a picture as we're just going to continuously keep walking and moving forward in this calling that we have from God. We don't want to just sit back and not respond to the call. We don't want to just run forward and get ahead of it and just do whatever we feel like we want to do and, and kind of impose our will on God. We want to be the ones that walk according to the calling that God has for us. And we get to also do that together as a church. When we are in the body of Christ, we get to help each other, point things out, edify, build up, even point things out that need to be adjusted, as Paul has been doing this entire time. And so that's why he ordains that in all the churches. That's why he's arranged for that attitude and that outlook in all the churches, because that needs to be present in all churches. There's no church that should not have that, right? So that's pretty much apparent as we go through. And he's, he's set this up to be that way. Um, it's a common occurrence, not an exception. This is, this is the way it needs to be. And that's why we look to the Bible, to you know, the Gospels, the book of Acts, the, the letters from Paul to model, to, to fulfill the things that God has called us to do. We, we only know what God's called us to do because we read his word and learn what it is. Because honestly, our instincts our thoughts and opinions on things are probably going to be skewed on our feelings and our flesh. We need to refer back to the instructions. We need to refer back to the base. We need to refer back to what is solid and what is understood. And that's why we go through the Word of God verse by verse so that we don't miss anything. We have the opportunity to receive the full counsel of God's Word. That's what we're trying to do. So this is exactly what Paul's doing. He's pointing this out and, and asking them or telling them to just walk in the calling that God has for you. Verse 18, he says, was anyone called? So he's going to talk about the calling part because sometimes there is a misunderstanding and maybe the question that they asked implied that there was a misunderstanding about the calling. And, and we kind of saw that before as, you know, what if I'm married and what if I'm not married and what if I have, I'm married to an unbeliever? And so there is the scenario thing. So he's saying, was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. And in this sense, he's really referring to the circumcision of like being of the Jewish heritage. Like you can be called by God into the new covenant out of the old covenant as a circumcised person. And it's kind of odd to think about it today, but um, there was a lot that went into that. More than just the surgical procedure, uh, common practice now for babies, but honestly, it meant a lot. Sometimes it meant you could operate in the world, and sometimes it meant that you couldn't operate in the world, like actually trade and buy and sell and, and do anything. There was actual restrictions based on who you were, and that circumcision represented something. Now also, circumcision was not a practice only of the Jews. Of course, we historically, it was practiced on other religions, and so it wasn't exclusive to the Jews, but it meant something specific to the Jews based on the Old Covenant, based on the covenant that Moses had with God, and that, and that was established in that sense. So he's saying, so yes, you were circumcised when you were called. So you were, you were a Jew who was practicing the Jewish faith, and you were called into the New Covenant. That's, that's perfectly fine. Don't, don't change your heritage or go back and unwind everything you've done, in a sense, and, and become something you're not. You know, embrace it. Actually, Paul talked about embracing the fact that the Jews, not that they're actually special people in and of themselves, but they were chosen by God to bring and produce the oracles of God. So they had the opportunity based on that, but it doesn't mean that they, you need to change everything about. You don't want to hide the fact that you're a Jewish heritage. You don't need to cover that up. I guess for me, it'd be like trying to cover up that I was a hick from the sticks. How, am I, am I going to just like you know, become Hollywood. No, I'm not going to do that. It's not going to work because I'm always going to be a hick from Walter County. That's just the way it is. There's no, but I can embrace that and God can use that. 
You know, and we all have our thing. We all have our heritage. We all have our where we came from. So he's saying, were you called all uh, circumcised? Don't unwind that. And, and I read in commentaries, there literally was ways and back in the day they could unwind that. We'll just let you think about that for a minute. And he says, was anyone called well uncircumcised? Let him not become circumcised. And there was that whole thing that was dealt with in Acts 15, uh, which we're not going to read the whole chapter, but it had to do with the fact that the um, the Judaizers were coming in and trying to impose the Jewish heritage of the Old Covenant and circumcision on Gentiles. And Paul was saying no. And they went to the, the Jerusalem Council, and which you know Peter was a part of that. And so they ended up coming up with a solution was to write the letter that says, no, don't do that. Right? So we, we understand that we don't need to become Jewish as part of being called. God's not going to call us to be Jewish because that is a, a lineage and that is a covenant under an old covenant that is established and has a purpose even in the future as we read in Revelation, but it has nothing to do with the new covenant in Jesus' blood. Jesus was a Jew, and, then, and he came, right, and he delivered the world, but not to deliver them to become Jewish and then be saved. Where It's not Jesus and the old covenant, like that type of thing. So he's saying don't impose these, the law on yourself, don't, don't go that direction because it's not going to gain you anything. As he says in verse 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. In and of itself, the act is nothing. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't do anything. If you, are, you can act circumcised without having the procedure done because it's a matter of the heart. You can do all kinds of things without having the physical altering of your body. So that's why it's nothing. It doesn't actually, it was a symbol. It was a representation it was an outward symbol of an inward change. We kind of do that in baptism today. It's an outward symbol of an inward change. It's a one-time deal, kind of like circumcision, but it's a little less permanent because we don't hold you under forever. You come back up renewed, right? So the baptism is representing that you can, you're representing yourself with Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. He comes back up. So don't be trying to do it in the flesh to, to add something on like circumcision, it says right here in verse 19, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. That is what actually matters, nothing else. He's, he's emphasizing the importance of faith over works. You can't earn your salvation by doing more holy things. You can't, you can't earn it. Your salvation is set. And then we believe that when you are saved, then works come from that. But it's not the act or the work that actually earns you anything. Okay? So he's being very careful to put this, that here. Guzik had a really good quote in his uh, commentary about this. He said, Paul's point isn't really about circumcision. That's just an example. I kind of talked about that. Even as being circumcised or uncircumcised is irrelevant when it comes to serving God, so is your current marital state. He could just as easily say, and is saying by analogy, married is nothing and unmarried is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. So you can kind of insert your reasoning here if you'd like you know it's the same idea you know the act of the the thing is not the focus it's the heart behind it right it's the matter of the the heart so it, that's exactly what you need to put the focus on not the thing not the object but the 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 meaning behind it what it's all about verse 20 let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called so it's an interesting one because he wants us to remain in the calling. He doesn't want us to necessarily put on something that doesn't fit and try to fit our, a square peg in a round hole. But there are also certain things that we know, uh, and if you take it out of context, then you could, you could layer a lot of things onto this. But it's not saying that no matter who you are or where you are or what you've done or what you're doing, you're all good. Just don't, don't leave the... Um, you know, don't really the same calling. D remain in the same calling, meaning like do whatever you were doing and continue to do whatever you're doing. It doesn't matter. Just be saved and move on. It's, it's not saying at all. And there's, there's a lot of denominational aspects today that some people embrace, like everyone, all, all roads, you know, all ways are right, which we know is actually wrong. But what he's saying here, let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called, He's going to go on to explain it in context. He gives examples, being in verse 21, while a slave, or, and, and he talks about the slavery thing, and it kind of adds that 
understanding that it's not just meaning like anything that you did or anything you're doing, just go ahead and, and maintain whatever you're doing. He's not saying that at all. Um, for example, and it, it kind of talks more about your, like the aspect of what you're doing for, your, for a living, for example. Because this is talking about slavery, which in that day was a, uh, a, an employable position. Like you were a bond slave or you could be a servant, you know, those types of things. It was, and just like Paul has talked about in other passages, uh, specifically in like Ephesians, we know that being employed in their day it was call, it could be called slavery, certain aspects of employment. So it, we, if we want to think of it that way, let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. I would say, you know, don't try to change your entire life in, in a sense, like everything about it, including like being married or not being married or, you know, different aspects that really don't have anything to do with your salvation or your calling. Because you don't want to, like you said before, you don't want to limit what God can do in your life, in your situation. You've gained a lot of, uh, you know, people and, and, and relationships. And so if you suddenly are a changed person and you remain in the calling and you're, you're kind of doing the same thing and you suddenly appear different, that's going to be more dramatic than if you just peace out, go somewhere no one ever knows who you are and just show up one day and you're completely, that's the first time I've ever met you before. There's no dynamic. Like everyone I went to high school would be looking me sideways because I'm not the same person I was. And that's more of a glory to God than me showing up to some random person's classroom and saying, hey, how, nice to meet you. How's it going? Like, they have no context. They have no reason to understand anything different. Like, you're a pastor. Yep. Well, that's cool. Like, as, as opposed to, you're a pastor. Do you remember who you were back then? Like, yes, I do. I do. And it's, I'm different. Now, one thing I did mention to myself, I, I took some notes. Um, some people um, have a lifestyle that they are in that could be considered criminal. So I would say this is not referring to that. So if you're a criminal and you're doing criminal activity, then you shouldn't be in the colony in which you were called. You should stop the criminal activity. So just that's like a disclaimer, a little, like a little asterisk at the bottom there. Because, you know, you could maybe justify that and say, the Bible said not to change what I'm doing, even though I'm whatever. You know, I'm not going to get into it. But you know what I'm saying, okay? So in the same calling, the same call from the Lord in which you were summoned by God, as you repent and you change your life, you know, you don't necessarily have to change all those details at once. He might call you to a different job. He might call you to a different town. He might do that over time, but don't, don't use your salvation as an excuse to like wipe everything in your life completely away and just go somewhere else where nobody knows where you are. That's not what he, he's saying. Don't be that dramatic because that's not going to be giving God the opportunity to work in the situation that he, he called you from. And so you don't want to take that opportunity away because the, there's more glory to God in that. I think that's what, that's what he's trying to say. Like, let each one remain in the same calling. Don't panic. Don't freak out. Just let it ride for a minute. See what happens. See what God's going to do with your new transformed life in the calling with which you were called. And then he gives the example where you call while a slave, and the, the word for slave is uh, doulos, which is the bond slave, which ironically, we use that term in the New Testament to describe believers, you know, slaves of Christ. And, uh, and he kind of talks about that in verse 22. So, you know, in one sense, it could be a derogatory term, and you might feel like if you're a slave or a bond slave in that day, that was your employment, you made that decision while unsaved, you feel like maybe you're entitled to having that undone because I have changed my mind. Well, you kind of can't change your mind in that day. This was the way it was. You, you made a commitment for life. So you were in that, unless you were freed. And that's why he says here, if you were called while a slave, maybe you could be made free. Go ahead and use that. But don't be concerned about it. He says, don't, not, don't be concerned. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be bogged down by just obsessing about your freedom if you were called while a slave. Because God can use the fact that you're a slave. He's like, don't put it past God to use that situation for his glory. Don't try to, in the flesh, try to get what you feel like you want, deserve, need to do, unless God calls you to do it. He's like, well, if that's the case, if it just comes up, then use it. But he's like, don't focus on that. He's going to talk about focus. Sometimes we get really focused on things that are not important or aside from the point, right? We get focused on the minor things. We don't look at the major. We don't you know, kind of relax and zoom out a little bit and take in the full perspective. So he's like, so if you were a slave, don't be concerned about it. Don't be overly worried about it. 
um, you know, the word for concern could be like um, taking an interest. Don't, don't be so obsessed about or concerned with that one thing, um, giving it all your thought because that's going to take away from anything else that's going on. Don't be concerned about it. He's like, don't worry about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. If you can be released and that's what happens and that's what God does. Now, yet some of the commentators made a point that, and some people emphasize in this case that Paul is saying, you know, if you can, do it. I, I don't see it as that emphatic. If, he says to me, if you can be made free, that's possible, use it. But some of them are saying to like, do everything you can to be made free from that situation within you know, like certain things, like buying your own freedom, which is a thing. You could actually buy yourself out of your contract, which we can do that today. That's like a settlement. So you could go to them and you could try to settle. He's, I think he's saying here, that could be the case. If God wants you to do that, and that's his will for you, then that's going to come up. And there is a huge balance in life of the things that you know, God is calling you to do and that he expects you to do that require you to do something yourself. It doesn't always just show up in your lap. Maybe the, maybe the boss doesn't show up and say, hey, you know what? I just felt led by the Lord to free you. If you want it, go ahead. That might happen. But I think he's saying, don't get so obsessed, like every day come in and like, I just got to get as much money as I can. I got to borrow money. I got to do everything I can to get it. So then you're completely unable to do anything except obsess about yourself. That sounds gross, right? Because it really does put the focus on you and not on the Lord. If you're obsessed about being made free, he's like, you know, just use it if it comes up, but otherwise just don't worry about it. You know, a little anxiety um, killer right there. Just like, don't worry about it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's free man. So in the, in the Lord's eyes, you're, in, in, you're free to serve him even as a slave. You don't have to worry about it. You're not being restricted at all in God's eyes. He is not concerned whatsoever about that state that you're in. He's actually the Lord's freed man. You're working for the Lord. You're his freed man in, in that sense, right? And then likewise, he who is called while free. So say you're a, a believer and you are completely free. You're not a bondservant. He's saying, guess what? You're a slave. Just like we said, you're a due loss. So either way, it doesn't matter, but don't get so obsessed and so focused. And I think all these things tend to be the focus. We get so hyper-focused on things, and we do that in our society today. We get really hyper-focused on things, and we can't get our eyes off the situation, and we just continue to go down that road over and over and over again saying, listen, that's, that's not what's going to be edifying. That's not going to be what's good. You know, if you're a slave, you're the Lord's free man. Don't even, just put that out of your mind. And if you're free, well, you guess what? You're a slave anyway. So you're all on the same page. You're all working for the same Lord and Savior. You're all of the same salvation. Because he says in verse 23, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. And it was actually verse uh, 20 of chapter 6 that talked about that. He said, for you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So he made a mention of the same, the same thought of being bought. We are purchased. When we purchase something, we have a right to have it, to take it. It's ours. We bought it. So when you think about it that way, Christ bought us at a price. So that's the, the semicolons there saying that could be a complete sentence. So we are bought at a price. And if you think about it, I, I come back to this verse so many times. It's, it's so... It's definitely one of my, I mean, the whole Bible is a life verse, but I always think about this when I think about getting selfish and thinking about myself. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul is, says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I love the fact that it says reasonable service because it, it's not one of those like high and mighty lofty things. Like, how could this be? This is reasonable. It's reasonable if someone bought you at a price, that you are their slave. And if your Lord, your God, bought you at a price and he freed you from sin, now you are his bondservant. That's reasonable. It's not unreasonable to think that you would have a changed life and actually be, as he says in verse 2, um, not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mindset will change. It won't match. When you think about things and then you look at how the world thinks about things, they're not going to match up. That's reasonable and that's good. It's actually a good gauge. If you're agreeing with the world on a lot of things, there might be a problem, right? If you're conformed to the world 
and you're not being transformed by the renewal of your mind, it's not doing what he says, which is proving what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. He wants you to think differently. He wants you to remember that you were bought at a price. He wants you to really embrace the fact that we are not our own. And he certainly doesn't want you to become slaves of men. We're not going to get bogged down with the cares of the world. He's going to talk about cares a little bit later, but the cares of the world, things you're obligated to that are temporal, those are the things we need to shy away from. We need to back off of those things. Don't become slaves of men and what they think and the things that they want you to do and expectations of other people, especially not in the church. We need to put our focus more, and not necessarily on a church, but the church, because the church, the body of Christ, is everything in this life. It really should be. I feel like sometimes, and I've had the same mentality, is that we, we feel like church is just a thing that we do. It's just a place that we go and we, once a week, and that's it. But it really is about living. It's about walking. It's about your entire life is different. And if it's not, then you should really pray about that or ask somebody about that, because that is exactly what Paul is saying. This is not just for a couple of ex- or, you know, like really fanatical people. Not for just a couple people that you know, act like this. Those are the, the really churchy people, and then everyone else is just normal. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Everyone is bought at a price. Nobody should become slaves of men. We're all in the same boat. We are all in the body of Christ. We all have different roles to play, different things to do. God calls us at different places in our lives. We do different things. But we're all united in Christ as the body. That is the same. So we don't want to exclude ourselves from that. We don't want to take ourselves out of the opportunity that God has for us by just having that mentality where it's like it's not really a life-changing thing. That it's not something that really makes a difference in our lives. That it's just something that we, we check a box. Don't become slaves of men. Men will tell you, you know, feel better about yourself, check a box, move on. The Bible, God is telling you, invest your time, your effort, your energy in the things of God. That is what matters, not the other stuff. Everything else is temporal. Everything else is going to burn up. He's going to talk about that later too. So brethren, he's talking to the the believers. Let each one remain with God. That's important. You're going to remain where you're at with God. So it's not remaining by yourself, looking from the outside in. You're saying you're with God in the state in which you were called. God is right there with you in the state you're called. You're not at a distance looking on the horizon just needing to start moving toward his calling. You're called now. And he's going to grow you and edify you and he's going to bring you to that sanctification process, that being made holy. You're going to do that stuff that he calls you to but you don't have to worry about being kind of on the outside. Remain with God in this state, which you were called. Remember that God is with you through this entire thing. That is an important detail that a lot of times we might miss. I think a lot of times we get frustrated, we get really um, overtired, we get just to the end of burnout, and we feel like God is not there, but it says we're to remain with God in the state we're called. God's there with us the whole time. Every step that we take, he's there. We, he just Maybe we're not listening or looking for him. That's, that's our bad. All right, verse 25 as we continue. We change the subject again. Remember that he's getting questions asked of him. And so what we're seeing here is there was a question asked about uh, virgins. So let's just read what he says in the context here. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. Um, So we'll stop there for just a second. So this is now talking about a different subject, right? So we've got this thing about virgins, and the word for virgins is a a woman who has never had sexual relations. It's literally, you know, not known to man. So essentially what he's talking about, when he says, I have no commandment, what we have is no historical context that the Lord has spoken on the subject specifically. But what we do have is the Lord has given judgment to someone who is trustworthy like Paul to read into what has been commanded and then can 
gain from that specific advice that seems good and because he's, he's trustworthy, which basically trustworthy means he's faithful, reliable, loyal, like he is full of faith, like that type of thing. So it's not to say it's just, well, this is, it is his opinion in one sense, but his opinion is based on scripture. There's just no place, kind of like before we talked about this, there's no specific place that gave us that commandment from God. And he's not giving us a thus saith the Lord, like, like the old school prophets did. So it's, it's completely in the spirit. It's just not relating to or drawing from a previously commanded state from Jesus himself when he was in his ministry, which is the, the pattern he's been doing in this type of writing as he's been addressing this. And that's important for us too, because as we read scripture and we read into the heart behind certain things that are said, in this current context, we're able to glean from that understanding that is spiritual in nature that God has for us. For example, there is nothing in the Bible about certain substances that we are able to partake of today. Some of them legally. There's nothing that says anything about that. There's no specific, but there is a subject of pharmacia that really in, in, like encapsulates that subject completely. So we can know that if this is the result of what you're doing and it actually fits into here, it's the same thing. But it doesn't have to say specifically the item that we, and even using the street jargon we use today, they can say, well, there's nothing about that in the Bible. We're like, well, if that's the way you want to think about it, that's fine. But I think it speaks enough on the subject generally to give you an understanding as to what, what is your heart behind what you're doing right now and why are you doing it? And that doesn't match up with scripture. And so therefore, if you're becoming drunk or intoxicated and your mind is being altered, then that's a problem, regardless of what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. So those types of examples, people can draw those things out and they can say specific things. So Paul is saying, yes, we don't have a very specific teaching or commandment from the Lord specifically, but my judgment in this, I think, is, is trustworthy. So he's giving them the answer to their question. Otherwise, there are some things that we maybe can't say 100%, but these types of questions, he's, he's giving them biblically sound advice that makes sense. And you're just addressing the question that they had about virgins. So he says, I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress. Now, another interesting thing is we don't really have any context about the present distress. Otherwise, perhaps they wrote about a present distress. It doesn't tell us what the distress is. He just says, because of the present distress, that it is, it is good for a man to remain as he is. And so with the word present or eminent or current distress, whatever was happening, it was, it was an issue, a pressing situation. There was an issue going on with um, virgins in that day, and there was a distress of some kind that related to that. And so he's just kind of relating it back to them that they would understand, but we unfortunately don't have the full context which is okay. It's just, it's just, you can kind of, you can try to guess, but it doesn't really matter in the end. His, what he's trying to say is that there's all kinds of things that'll go on in life, but in the end, it's good for a man to remain as he is. Paul's particular perspective, being single, being um, called to that singleness, even we believe being called out of a marriage, whether it was Whatever the determination was, we talked about that last time, but the, Paul most likely was married um, before he was saved, and then after he was saved, somehow he was loosed from that marriage within the, the definitions of what was set up in Scripture. We don't have that answer, but he is able to relate to people in that way. And he, what he's saying is that when there is distress, um, it's it's easier or better for a man to remain as he is. He's, he's not obligated to things that a married man is obligated to. And it's not to say those obligations are bad. It's actually to say that they're just there. If you are married and you have children, you have obligations above and beyond and included with your other obligations to the Lord. He's not going to say, forsake your obligations and just do this. Because that would be going against himself. So what he's saying here is that, yeah, if you're asking my opinion and I'm going from what's here, if you're to remain focused on God, especially in a distressing situation, it's definitely better or good for a man to remain as he is, if he's able to do that. So if you just look at that part, and then you continue, he, in verse 27, he says, okay, and with that, are you bound to a wife? He's like, he's not going to give a general answer. You know how people want you to give a general answer so they can be like, aha, I knew it. 
you, you just said that, and like, then it's all weird. He's like, okay, well, uh, and the, I guess the good thing is he's writing a letter. There's no back and forth in this situation, right? But he said, all right, so I'm going to answer you, but I'm also going to ask you some questions along with it. Which category do you fall into? Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loose. He kind of already talked about this. Are you loose from a wife? Do not seek a wife. He's like, so whatever state you're in, like he just said, embrace that one. So he's saying about virgins, if they're currently a virgin, that means that they're not married or, you know, so they're, he's, he's just kind of giving this scenario, he's like kind of laying them out. There's, there's different categories for people wherever they're at. He's like, in the end though, verse 28, but even if you do marry, you have not sinned. He, so he's, he's also very careful to make sure that he points out that this is not a matter of sin. This is a matter of preference. This is a matter of just like fact, right? So there's some, he's saying there's some people that are called to a life of celibacy and there's some people who are not. And so whatever state you're in, you get to make a choice. And he's going to go into that a little bit more in a minute. He's like, so wherever you fall into that category, whatever your decision is, seek your, seek your answer from the Lord. Embrace what the Lord is telling you. And um, it's not a sinful issue. It's not a, it's not a problem of sin. It's a, it's a matter of preference. <clears throat> kind of like I've talked about that today's environment in the world with the, um, with the TikToks and the YouTubes and all these things that happen in the Facebooks. Um, everyone seems to think that everyone wants to know their opinion on everything and that if my opinion is different than yours, then I'm right and you're wrong. But that's actually not true. You could even say the same thing with food. There's a million bajillion different types of food and Everyone probably likes one of them, like, and, and maybe someone else doesn't. It doesn't make them wrong, right? It's really hard, you know, because we live in a, a, a society of like five-star ratings and, you know, categories and, you know, all the reviews and all these things are very important, but it's all just opinion. One person could love one thing and one person could hate the same thing, and it doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it a fact that there's different preferences for things, right? So some people may... Um, be a virgin and continue that whole thing and be celibate the rest of their life. Some people may be a virgin and they want to get married. And some people might have had a, ma a wife and they either died or they were divorced. Um, or whatever the situation is, it doesn't really matter. He's saying in the state you're in as brethren, as Christians, remain in the state which you're called and, and do the thing that God's calling you to do. But just know that your decision is not a sinful decision. If this is what you're deciding, there are sinful decisions to make. This particular one is not one of them, right? However, we did talk about this last time. If you want to get married for the wrong reasons, then that would also be a sinful decision. So you just got to put it in the right context. And that's why he gives all these questions. So you can think about where you fall into line in these things. But so at verse 28, even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I will spare you. Now, um, it, obviously, relationships are complicated, right? Relationships are always complicated. And so it's, he's not kind of shying away from that. He's just saying, listen, you're going to have trouble in the flesh. And it's not necessarily that marriage is all trouble, but it's the fact that there is going to be more trouble in a marriage than there is in a non-marriage. Because that's just a fact. There's, there's one person with the Lord, and then there's two people with the Lord. Like, it's like trying to give... Like this morning, tried to have little kids pick a TV show to watch for 10 minutes and no one can decide and everyone's upset. But if it was just one kid, what do you want to watch? Oh, that's it. All right, good. We're on. All set. Moving on. That's the way you can think about it that way. Same idea. He's like, I, I'm telling you, I would spare you, he says. I would, I would love to spare you or have you abstain from the problems that come from a marriage. But he's not saying it's all problems. He's saying there are problems. Right? So embrace that. And that's what marriage counseling is all about, to remind people that there are problems in marriage from time to time, sometimes more than others. That's just the way it is. So it's just the practical advice. He's really just wanting them to, to not um, make a, 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 a rash decision. You know, make, a, make a wise decision. Um, but then he goes on here and... Uh, and continues to explain a little bit more about why he's saying that. Because, and we're going to talk about this in just a second, but think about, from Paul's perspective, um, he's thinking that there's, there's no time to waste. And I think that that mentality was designed by God to help us 
in our life even 2,000 years later. Okay, and we're going to go into that in just a second, but just think about this. There is an, an eminent return of Christ at any time, and that mentality is a healthy one. And it's designed, I believe, by God, so that we're not just sitting on the couch waiting around for something. We're actually actively waiting and anticipating something. There's a difference, right? Not just get saved and then sit back on the Christian couch and wait for God to arrive. We have things to do, and it could be any time, right? So with that, he says... This I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who, and then, just out of context, there's a comma, it continues, it doesn't stop there, because that's a little weird sentence. Those who weep as though they did not weep, those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use this world as not misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. There's the full, sent, two sentences, full context of what he's saying. Because if you just take that one thing, I say, brethren, the time is short. You know, act like you're not even married if you are. That's a weird thing to say. Like, <laughs> what is he saying? Why would you say that? That's really, after what you just said, Paul, what are you doing? So, again, when people take one verse and they just, you know, murder it like that, it can really mess with your head and you get this weird feeling in your, in your body that's like, you know, I don't like what was just said or it, you know, I, I can't believe this was just said. You know, I can't believe this is going on. And then if you actually read the rest of it, you'll be like, oh, okay. Well, I guess I can, I can understand. So let's, let's talk about this. So the time, and I love this word time. Because the time, we think about time in, in a clock. But this time is kairos, which means it's a season or an, an opportunity or an occasion. Like it's a fitting season. This is the time. The time, the season is short. And it's wrapping things up. There's a limit to the season. And we know that to be true. It's going to come to an end. We were told that that end would be when the Lord returns or pulls his church out. Right? So there's, um, there's some who want to say that um, Paul was either a false prophet because he predicted something that didn't happen or because um, it's, it's been a long time. But it's all relative, right? The word short and long, like he's saying short because it's going to be, the season will come to an end. The season of the, you know, we call it the church age. This season will be short in comparison to all eternity. It's not going to be that long. Or you think about your entire life being a little dash on a, on a gravestone between two dates. It's relatively short considering um, that everything in the Old Testament has been established from creation all the way through all the old prophets and then all of a sudden the Messiah comes and he's killed and he's resurrected and he goes up and now the season is short. We don't know how long it's going to be but we need to act like it could be any day. So that's a short season. Some people get all, all whacked out about that. Um, so some people say Paul sounded a false alarm because it hasn't happened yet and it's never going to happen. We've actually we've read about that mentality that some people have that mentality, right? It's like it's never going to happen who cares? Just live your life and move on. That's some people's attitude about it. Um, there are others who are like way out there and actually say that Jesus has already come and gone and we're in the twilight zone or the outer limits or something. I'm not sure what they're thinking, but you know, there's, that's the other people. All right? And then um, we, there's those that find a balance. And that's what I would hope to do is find a balance and that we should, like I said, always live in a manner that's an expectation. We should always be ready um, to give an answer and for our Savior to return. Whatever we're doing, whatever is going on at that moment, be ready to face our Lord. That's a good mentality to have. If, no matter what is happening, whether you're disciplining your children, whether you're working, whether you're even sleeping, whatever you're doing, what, you know, wh whatever it is, anything you're doing, are you ready to then turn around and be face to face with your Lord? And he was going to say, what are you doing? Or what were you doing? And you'd be like, this, and it was all good. You know, instead of being like, yeah, I meant to say something about that. I was meaning to change things, but I didn't get around to it. Like, we, we can't live like that. We're, we're to always have the expectation of our Savior returning at any time, right? So we need to live our lives very seriously and act in a manner that believes that he could return at any moment. We need to do that. For, not for our own sake alone, but for the sake of those within the church and the sake of our families and our friends and the people we interact with every day because they're going to see a different mentality coming out of a person who believes that versus a person who just says that or doesn't even think about it, right? There's a huge difference in that. 
completely. Okay, so the time is short. So that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. It's, again, it's talking about don't get hyper-focused on certain things. Like don't, in, in the context of what you do in your life, we have to maintain as a, this, this might cramp your me time a little bit, maybe we'll say it that way. So you, know, you have a spouse, children, you have work, you have all these different things that you need to do, but you should be focused so much on what the Lord wants you to do, which is going to include those things and not get hyper-focused on the little things or the, like, the, the little events, like getting really upset, weeping, and like even being super happy. Like, like Christmas and birthdays are every day type of, like that's not going to happen. Or you're not going to be super sad every single day like to the point where you're weeping constantly. If you are, you know, seek some help and find someone to talk to. And then even he talks about buying as though they did not possess. Like when you buy something, you're consuming it no matter what it is. You buy a brand new car, it's being consumed rapidly by the salt on the, on the, in Maine anyway, right? You buy a house and it's not really appreciating, it's depreciating because every day that goes by, that time is ticking away on this house. It's not going to last. No matter what you invest in in this earth, it's not going to last. That's why he ends the whole thing on the form of this world is passing away. That's why he's talking about use the world is not misusing it. It's misusing stuff to be focused on the stuff. The stuff is just a means to get us to the end. It's not the stuff. It's not the focus. It's the end. So he's saying, don't get focused on all the minutia, as Greg would say. He loves that word, minutia. Don't get focused on the minutia. Focus on the end result. Look to the end. You know, we're on our way there, and time is short. Don't waste your time. Focus on this stuff. So he's not saying that you should be married and act like you're not. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, you know, be married, do your things, and stay focused. And and be okay with that. Like there, there is a time for it being like downtime and, and family time and even me time and all those things, but you need to do it in balance. You need to do it in the right perspective, looking forward to the end. Because the form of this world, no matter what you're holding on to on this earth, you can't keep it. It doesn't matter what it is. Not even your marriage. Because when we're in heaven, it's not going to be the same anymore. That's what Jesus told us. So no matter what you have now, None of it can go with you at all. So if you're so focused on it now, that's the wrong approach. That's the wrong mindset. You've got to get off of that because it's going to mess you up. It's going to make you waste your time. The season is short. You don't have a lot of time. It's like, let's talk, let's talk about this. So say you want to be a hunter and you've never gone before like me. And I can shoot a gun, but I've never actually even tried to think about how to hunt, how to aim it, what to hit how to field dress the thing, and then I'm going to go out at 4 p.m. and start hunting? Time's a little short. You don't have much time at this point. Your sun's going down on your opportunity to be hunting at this point. You know what I'm saying? So the more you wait around and you don't invest in the things you need, if you want to be a hunter, you need to go to a hunter safety course. Buy some orange. Get a rifle. Practice with it. You know, like learn about the anatomy of a deer, how to cut it open. Like that's what you need to do. So as a Christian, you need to learn how to be one and do it, and practice it, and get with people who do it all the time, and focus on the right stuff. That's what Paul's trying to say here. He's not talking about not being married when you're married. That, that's weird. So don't do that. So because the form of the world is passing away. It's passing away. Um, and the form is the schema. That's the word. So it's the schematic. The, the actual present form of the world is going to be disintegrated. Um, Peter said it's going to um, kind of burn up real hot. It's going to be passing away and disappear. Everything we see now, it's going to be gone. So don't worry about it. That's basically what I think he's saying anyway. Because then he says in verse 32, but I want you to be without care. Um, without care, the word means uh, concern, um, free, even free from anxiety in some contexts. It, it doesn't want you to get all bogged down with these things, get all concerned about these things. Um, he who is unmarried cares for the things of the, of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. So in this, he's saying that he's only trying to spare them, like it's in verse 28, and try to help them understand there's going to be trouble and know that I don't want you to get bogged down with the things of marriage necessarily if you can stand it, if you're called to that, because there's more of an opportunity to serve the Lord in that. There's more of an opportunity to, to care about the things of the Lord, how you may please the Lord, 
Because the, the reality is, is if you are married, then you are called to almost divide that time up. You have to. Because you can't neglect your spouse if you're a Christian. But you are now forced to take, you can't take a second and make it into two. You can't split your time like that. It actually is divided. You only have a half a second. When you divide something, it has to be split up. So if you're married, you have to divide your time. There's no way around it. When you have children, you have to divide your time. You have to find the time, carve it out. There's no other way around it. You can't make more time. It doesn't work that way. So the time is short. He's trying to spare them from the, the additional obligation if that's what they're called to. He's like, if you're asking me, I'm telling you this is maybe better. This might help you out if you want to think of it this way because you can please the Lord as a Christian more if you're unmarried because you don't have to focus or divide your time. So that's, that's a good thing you know, in, if you just put it all out there. Now, it's not always possible. And he's actually talked about that it's not possible for every single person to be as Paul is. And so he's giving room for that too. But just, just to put it out there, fact, black and white, you can't divide your time. He was married, cares about the things of the world because you have to. You have to, to provide for your family. You can't just go walk the mountains by yourself and not care about anything. If you've got a wife and kids at home, that's not paying the bills. That's not providing them what they need. That's not covering them. That's not washing your wife with the water of the word. That's not doing anything except just going on a mission by yourself. Some people do have mission trips they go on, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about dividing your time up. It's going to happen if you're married and it's just the way it is. He said there's a difference between a wife and a virgin, verse 34. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit, but she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Same, same idea, um, you know, back the other, other way. So it's just from the different perspective. Now, one thing that I wanted to point out in that, and this is maybe a practical uh, historical context for this, you know, kind of how you can think about it. Um, Jesus in Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44, um, made a statement, he, an observation. And it kind of like encapsulates what is being said here. He says this, Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants, which is not a lot of money. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had, her whole livelihood. Now the reason that is, makes sense here is because she's unmarried, she's serving the Lord, and she made a decision to put her entire livelihood into the pot. She didn't have to consult anybody except God. She's trusting the Lord to provide for her. She made that decision on her own because she is her own woman. She's a widow. She's not obligated. If she was married, she would need to make that decision with her spouse because that's part of the deal, right? She can't just take all the money and throw it in a box and then he's chasing after her because we haven't bought any bread. We can't feed the kids, you know, like stuff like that. You can't do that. So again, that's a practical um, example of what Paul is trying to say. He's trying to show how those things have to be in place, right? And he goes on to say, this I say for your own profit, not that I may put, he says, it says a leash, um, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. Now, the reason it says leash is because they didn't really, what a leash does, it restrains something, right? Hold something back like your dog, right? We're not putting leashes on people in the Bible. This isn't what it is. It actually is better uh, translated noose or like a, a snare. It's, it's really like obligating someone at, by force. You know, I'm not, gonna, I'm not forcing you to do something. This is for your benefit, your profit. This is for you to bring, for gain. Um, not, not my me putting some obligation or restriction on you that I'm holding you back, that I'm the one telling you what to do and I'm the, like jerking the chain like that. That's not what I'm saying. It's a, it, but it's for what is proper, that you may serve the Lord without distraction. He's saying, let's, Let's say what it is. It's, it's just so that it's the best thing, that you're not distracted by the things of the world. That's the only reason. And that's for your benefit, for your profit. So don't, don't worry about that. Um, Guzik said this. I liked what he said. He said, um, though Paul insists he does not want his teaching here to be regarded as a noose around anyone's neck, 
this has happened in the church. Roman Catholics insist on celibacy for all their clergy, even if they are not gifted to be so. Many Protestant groups will not ordain or trust the single. So man has adapted certain things that come from maybe a good thing, and they've twisted them into an issue. Think about all the problems that we see coming out of the church because of forced celibacy and like all kinds of weird issues that happen, all this perversion that happens. That shouldn't be. There's no commandment for those things. It's just the rules of men. So again, Paul's trying to say, like, follow your conscience, follow with the Lord, do, this is for your profit, but it's not me just restricting you or commanding you in something. It's just, so it's for proper um, service to the Lord without distraction. That's, that's his goal. He's not trying to benefit personally from any of this. He's not trying to be like, I'm bossing the Corinthians around. I'm telling them what to do. And if they don't do it, I'm going to crack the whip on them and kick them out or whatever. He's not saying that. He's like, this is so you can serve the Lord without distraction. And, and even if you do, have a distraction in a marriage, it, like if you're already married or whatever, he's like, that's okay. Don't try to get out of it and wipe the slate clean. That's, he's really just going over this over and over to make sure they get it, right? Verse 36, uh, but if any man thinks he is behaving improperly toward his virgin, if she is past the flower of youth, and thus it must be, let him do whatever he wishes. He does not sin, let them marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin, does well. So then, he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. Now, I'm going to stop there just for a second because, well, maybe more than a second, but this is interesting. As I was doing the study, I found that those particular verses, for some reason, are highly debatable by commentators. It's weird. One thing just to think about, and I looked it up, all of the pronouns, which we love the word pronoun today, but all the pronouns are non-definite. It actually doesn't say gender-specific pronouns in the original text. And so that's where people get their open interpretation to what it's, what it's saying here. And I'm just going to give you the, the viewpoints because th they're out there and they're kind of interesting. So first thing, um, one way to interpret the passage is to, to know about the culture of the day. You know, we have arranged marriage. We, we kind of understand it's a thing. We don't practice that today in America, but in the world it is practiced. And in this day, it was highly practiced. It was more of a a uh, business obligation or like a business venture where you can join two families together for the better of everybody and that was a good thing. So there, that's, that's one thing. And so basically, if you think about it that way and what we just read, and considering too that the New King James Version that I read, I'm going to read a couple others real quick just to compare, it assumes the context is talking about a father talking about a daughter because that's why they insert the pronouns. Does that make sense? So when we read the pronouns, just know that the other versions, I, I don't necessarily <laughs> agree with them, but they're saying because of that, you can kind of read into it a little different. So uh, just keep that in mind. In my version, it puts the pronouns in there gender specific because so, it has to based on the, the uh, interpretation of it. Okay, so what he's basically saying is, all right, so if you're a dad and you feel like you, know, you want your daughter to be in that situation, where she's able to serve the Lord, and that's what you want to, you're going to like almost sacrifice your ability to gain that business partnership with this other family for the Lord. And it's like, that's great. But it says, if any man thinks he's behaving improperly toward his virgin because of that mentality, he's saying that, and then it says she's past the flower of youth. That just means that she's of age to marry, if you wanted to know. And, and thus it must be. So basically, if she's not called celibacy, and he's forcing that on her as the father, and then it just doesn't work out. You're like, don't worry about it. You're not sinning to let them marry in that case. That's what he's trying to say. Does that make sense? So he's saying, all right, so if you, if you have a check because she's coming at you saying, I want to get married. And he's saying, dad's saying, no, we want to serve the Lord. We got this letter from Paul. I talked a lot about being, you know, staying unmarried, and that's better. You know, Paul says it's better. Let's do that. But she's saying, I want to get married. He's saying, don't fight that because clearly she doesn't have the gift of celibacy. Don't force that on her. You're not sinning to let them marry. I also think that he put that thing about he does not sin because of what was already said. We already went over when there is sin and it needs to be addressed. So he doesn't want them to be overambitious and say, this guy let his virgin daughter marry and they shouldn't have because Paul had talked about it. it's better this way. You know what I mean? So 
He doesn't want them to get carried away. So he's saying it doesn't, it's not a sin to get married. Clearly, God ordained marriage. If there, she's not called to um, celibacy, you're not, you're not doing the wrong thing to allow it to happen. Go ahead and do it. It's fine. Okay? So that's one, that's one take on it. Um, when you read the, actually the New International Reader's Version, it actually gives you the, the, a different kind of look on it um, altogether. So here's what it says, the same passage. It says, suppose someone is worried that he is not acting with honor toward the virgin he has promised to marry. So now it's not the father, but it's the, the man who's getting married. So that's how they interpreted the passage. So just you see, see how that works all of a sudden? Like if, if you just kind of change the, just shift the lens a little bit, you see it a little differently. Um, so it says here, um, Suppose his desires are too strong and he feels that he should marry her. He should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But suppose the man has decided not to marry the virgin and suppose he has no compelling need to get married and can control himself. If he has made up his mind not to get married, he also does the right thing. So then the man who marries the virgin does the right thing, but the man who doesn't marry her does a better thing. So as you read that translation in that context, when they put everything together, that could make sense too somewhat. I, I don't necessarily agree with that completely. Um, but um, that is another way to think about it. Um, and then I was reading a commentary that gave another perspective, which I thought was interesting. And I'm going I'm to quote this from the commentary just instead of trying to re recreate it. The B Believer's Bible Commentary says this. says the RSV translates virgin as betrothed. So it takes the word virgin and says betrothed. And, and by the way, the word for virgin there could be male or female, technically. Again, not gender specific in the original language. So with that, if you translate it betrothed, it says the thought would then be that if a man marries his betrothed or fiancé, he does not sin. But if he refrains from marrying her, it's better. And then there's a commentary named William Kelly, who believes that the word virgin could also be translated virginity, and thus the passage is not speaking about a man's virgin daughters, but about his own virginity. That's another aspect of it. According to this interpretation, the passage is saying that if a man maintains the unmarried state, he does well, but if he decides to get married, he does not sin. So again, like three or four different viewpoints on this, but in the end, I think it makes the most sense in the context of the historical, that this translation, especially being word for word, and in the kind of the flow, it goes from your own decision to then um, talking about someone else. I think it really refers to the, the young girl. But again, it doesn't actually matter because in the end, the final assessment from Paul is that um, either way is good. Not married is better. That's, that's Paul's like, take on it. And so either way you translate it, it doesn't actually matter except that you follow the Lord in the calling in which you were called. That is it. Whatever the Lord directs you to do when it comes to marriage, go with that. That's basically what he's trying to say. All of this because they all need their reasons. This is the, uh, the what ifs. But what if this? But what if that? But what if, you know, and he's addressing the what ifs. That's why there's all these things. So there must have been a lot of what ifs in that letter to Paul. Like a lot of, but, but there's this guy and then there's this specific situation. And so he's trying to address all these things. All right, last two verses and then we're done. 39, a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. But she is happier if she remains as she is according to my judgment. And I think I also have the Spirit of God. All right, so again, Paul is now speaking from the married perspective in contrast to what we just talked about not getting married, right? A wife is bound by law by law, to her husband as long as her husband lives. But if he dies, she is at liberty to be married. And that just goes back to Romans um, chapter 7. It specifically calls out um, in, in the, uh, the text that uh, the woman who is a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. If the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So that's, that is the fact, right? So he's just stating a fact. And then if she dies, then she's, she's free to do it, whatever. But as a Christian, he's going to add the caveat at the end saying, okay, you're free to be married to whom she wishes. And then he adds, only in the Lord. That's, that's the, the key right there. It, this, so this is speaking to God's will in your life. 
And we talked about last time not being unequally yoked to an unbeliever. It's saying only in the Lord, only what the Lord has called together, only what the Lord is telling her to do is, is appropriate. Anything outside of that is not appropriate. And I liked what Wearsby said about this particular part of the verse. He said, marriage must be built on something sturdier than good looks, money, romantic excitement, and social acceptance. There must be a uh, Christian commitment, character, and maturity. There must be a willingness to grow, to learn from each other, to forgive and forget, to minister to one another. So it's more than just the superficial stuff. Only in the Lord. The Lord is not going to call us to superficial things. He's going to call us deeper than that. So it's going to be very clear, is, that, is what, I, what he's saying. It's going to be very apparent to, to not just yourself, but to other people, that this is going to be appropriate, that this is going to be of the Lord, this, this marriage to another husband. And then verse 40, but he's, he always adds this in because we know what Paul's saying. He's saying it's, it's all a matter of just your, your, your opinion. It's really just a matter of preference. He says, but she's happier if she remains as she is according to my judgment, and I think I have the Spirit of God. And, and some people remark that, um, that he's, he's kind of saying that he doesn't have the Spirit of God. Or he's doubting his spiritual calling, and, but that's not it. He's kind of being sarcastic and being like, I think... If I'm not mistaken, we've gone through seven chapters so far and I'm doing pretty good, right? I'm, the Lord is speaking. So that's what he's saying. I'm like, I, I think I have the Spirit of God. I'm, I'm giving you judgment that's based on God's Word. Check me. That's what he's saying. Go through and tell me if I'm not, right? That's kind of, he's kind of calling him out like that. Like, he went through a lot of what-if scenarios so far. He's kind of like, okay, let's, let's, check, let's check my work and see if I got where I needed to go. But it is true. He's saying it'll be happier if she remains unmarried. That's what he's been saying the whole time because of all the things he's already talked about. He's just reiterating at the end. So he thinks he has the Spirit of God. And I think the Spirit of God was here today speaking to us too. And now we've finally finished 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So with that, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to get into your word. We thank you for it being so direct and so perfect. And we thank you so much, Lord, for the ability to read and understand and to accept these things as you tell them to us, Lord. And so we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, guide and direct us through the, you know, the remainder of this book and even the things we spoke of today. Lord, we ask for your guidance and your direction. We want to do your will. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would continue to work with us where we're called, where we're at, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace.